I'm not sure if you've noticed, but the climate movement kind of sucks. We've known for decades now that the earth is in deep trouble, thanks to the actions of corporations. No amount of propaganda about personal carbon footprints and individual responsibility can take away from the fact that 100 companies are responsible for 71% of carbon emissions. I don't wish just my generation to see the writing on the wall so clearly, but we're kind of screwed. We need a serious movement, not plastic bag dance, we're not anti-capitalist extinction rebellion, not the toothless Greenpeace or UN Youth Councils, not the various puppet organizations funded by BP and Shell Oil that try to co-op the people's frustration. The climate movement is broken. There are two major currents in the climate movement that need to be seriously addressed. Firstly, capitalist environmentalists. Do I really have to explain why the power hungry, profit seeking, infinite growth and a finite earth nature of capitalism brought us into this mess? Please tell me I don't have to explain the source of our ever increasing air and light pollution, plastic clogged oceans, toxic rivers, destructive mining operations, deadly wildfires, devastating deforestation, global human trafficking network, waste trafficking, factory farming, food wastage, detrimental monoculture farming, drastic weather patterns, and utter ecological collapse. Despite all of this, there are still a ton of environmentalists out there who are advocating for a friendlier capitalism and social democracy, often mistakenly calling it socialism and ignoring the ways it too harms the planet while painting a green image. Mark Fisher recognized in his book, Capitalist Realism, that capitalism has so captured public thought that the idea of anti-capitalism no longer acts as the antithesis to capitalism. Instead, it's deployed as a means of reinforcing it. A lot of people recognize the flawed nature of capitalism, but believe there are no real means of effecting change. We need to recognize that from its very foundation, capitalism corrupts everything it touches, from individuals to communities to ecosystems to continents. As long as global capitalism continues to chug on, consuming everything it contacts, Earth and all its inhabitants is threatened with utter collapse. We face a global crisis and cannot waste our energy endlessly begging our callous rulers for weak policy reforms and commending corporations for slapping a green triangle on their products. We cannot pat ourselves on the back for signing and sharing petitions from a company that steals our information on the platforms of other companies that steal our information. Our earth is breaking down while we bark with our teeth, muzzled within the system designed to keep us down. There's a quote that says, it's easier to imagine an end to the world than an end to capitalism. You're going to need to revolutionize your thinking. Radical times call for radical imagination and a radical transformation of how the world can operate. Another response to these radical times has been the pox that is eco-fascism, which manifests itself in many environmentalist circles, sometimes unintentionally, but usually with much malice. Note when you see it. It can be seen in the notion that humanity is the virus that plagues this earth. Or worse, that certain people are a drain on this planet. Prevalent in the agenda of many eco fascists is human population control. The Malthusian myth of overpopulation sets the eugenicist sights on the oppressed. This idea that blames the most vulnerable members of society for ecological collapse removes responsibility from the rulers and corporations that brought us into this mess in the first place. Eco fascism thirsts for a totalitarian government who will take the reins of the climate issue and make the necessary sacrifices for the good of blood and soil. It utterly ignores how the exploitation of nature is contingent on the power structures it play in a society, and how overconsumption in the global north is responsible for much of Earth's damage. Humans are not a threat to Earth, or capitalist civilization is. Lose the misanthropy, we've been here for hundreds of thousands of years. And if there's one lesson we should learn, it's that civilization will fall. Civilization can be defined as a complex society characterized by the practice of agriculture and settlement in cities. Members of a civilization are organized into a diverse division of labor and an intricate social hierarchy. Throughout its use in the English language, the word civilization has been used the opposite of barbarism or primitivism. People act like civilization is the highest stage of human development, but the word's history demonstrates that the idea of civilization itself carries a ton of racism and imperialism. Civilization as we understand it first began in Sumer in 4000 BCE. They weren't the first to build cities, but they were the first to rely solely on year-round agriculture for the sustenance of their population. And that was only the beginning. Civilization spread worldwide. From Inca to Egypt to Rome to Mali to Ming to Scandinavia to Ethiopia to Khmer. And here we are, 6,000 years later, 
still plagued by the problems implicit in the most advanced stage of human development. See air quotes. Every civilization that has ever existed has had most or all of the following attributes in common. Imperialist warfare, genocide, domination of the majority by a minority, intense patriarchy and female commodification, exploitation of natural resources, exploitation of animals, reliance on unsustainable agriculture, controlling religious institutions, oppressive government, propaganda and censorship, violence, bigotry, xenophobia, oppression of indigenous peoples, and of course, slavery. Oh, and they've all fallen. Every single one of them. Civilization is fundamentally unsustainable. And of course, with the rise of capitalism in the last few hundred years, built on the backs of slaves and laborers, its problems have only been amplified. With so many issues our capitalist civilization is beset with, from an ever-expanding and always destructive consumerism, a declining economy, addiction to constantly diminishing oil reserves, devastation by natural disasters, planned obsolescence machines, and generation-spanning warfare, the chances of a major, positive transformation of civilization is rather slim. I mean, the civilization thing was an interesting experiment, don't get me wrong. There's a lot we got out of it. Science, medicine, agriculture, and specialization. We don't have to get rid of all these things. I'm not going to black or reject everything civilization brought us. But ultimately, as we move forward with its benefits, we're going to, need to let go and build something new and sustainable. We can't let another, more oppressive civilization take its place. I wish the move away from civilization towards something better would be peaceful. I really do. But those in power don't listen to reason. I'm going to reckon with the harsh dichotomy. What's going to collapse first? Industrial civilization or the Earth's ability to sustain life? Ecological collapse will shatter the world as we know it. Things are going to get messy. But don't stress too much. Despite the Hollywood movies, the best in people often comes out in crisis. Blackouts bring communities together and food shortages lead to food shares. No matter the circumstances of civilization's end, whether it be slow and withering or quick and catastrophic, we're going to need to be ready. What the climate movement needs is anarchism. The political philosophy that advocates for the abolition of state and capitalism in favor of a society organized without force or compulsion. The end of coercive authority and the beginning of a beautiful marriage of responsibility and freedom. A decentralized movement lets go of these oppressive, centralized and capitalistic states to foster harmonious and organic interrelationships between humans and other forms of life. We need to synthesize. That means we need to take the positive traits of the cultures, technologies and ideas of the past and present and combine them into definitive philosophy for the future. It means letting go of dualistic thinking, a this versus that that ignores the grey. It means teaching ourselves how to think critically and make informed choices. Otherwise, we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes of past societies. We must foster the ability to adapt to changing circumstances. Our world is in constant flux, and our movement must be able to flexibly respond to whatever challenges we face. What works in a Canadian winter is not going to work in hurricane season, Trinidad and Tobago. Our climate movement needs to integrate the intersections of oppression and recognize the ways that various identities are disproportionately harmed by ecological issues. We must build on the foundation of equal inclusion, opportunity, treatment and respect for all people, regardless of their race, ethnicity, nationality, ability, sex, gender or sexuality. These are issues that many pre-civ and civ societies fail to address. We cannot allow ourselves to do the same. We have a lot of damage to fix. Our plastic, radioactive waste, depleted ozone, car shells, they'll be here for a while. We can't uninflict those injuries, but we can work to heal them. Permaculture is a key value in that respect. It's not just gardening, by the way. Permaculture means thinking and acting with future generations in mind. We need to ingrain in ourselves, children, and society an ethos of ecological harmony and stewardship. We must act as much as we can in ways that demonstrate care for the planet and its diversity. We need to learn here and now the survival skills of the future. We need to build here and now the systems for our liberation. That's prefiguration, building the new in the shell of the old, understanding that means cannot be separated from ends. We must root ourselves in imminence, understanding that we have very little time. We must root ourselves in particularity, understanding that we ensure the well-being of the individual and the community. We must root ourselves in locality, understanding the unique challenges our communities face and how we can respond to them pragmatically. Things are going to get worse before they get better. We must empower ourselves and the people around us. Recently, a timer went up in New York. It says that we have seven years, 90 something days for carbon emissions to reach net zero so we can get this under control. 
as that psychological terror looms over the common folk, fat cats continue to line their pockets. Despite the pandemic, despite the wildfires, despite the evictions and job losses, despite the extinction of countless species every year, every day, despite it all, they thrive. They can live through this disaster in the short term with their private islands and reclusions. We can't. Wake up, educate, organize. We decide which way humanity goes. One person at a time, one affinity group at a time, one community at a time, one island at a time. We have to speak truth to power. That's what I'm trying to do. I hope you'll join me in the true fight for our planet and for humanity, preparing our culture for one of the most monumental shifts in human history. It's not as easy as signing a petition, but no one ever said that dismantling the state and capitalism would be easy. Defiantly insist that you are already free. Power to the people. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share. Check out my previous videos for other fascinating topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore same true and maybe send me some money and buy me a coffee. Most publishing blog posts every Tuesday around noon on medium.com slash at saint.true. Thanks again and peace.